Hello again, this is Jenny. Um, it's been a little while since we've cooked, but today we're going to do our final presentation and we're going to roast something, which will be in the oven, uncovered, fast, hot, dry heat, and that is intended for tender things. And today I'm going to make what my family loves to eat at um, a holiday. We don't do turkey and we rarely do roast beef. We do pork loin. And the loin is always the most tender muscle, and it comes right down the body of an animal, thinking that the animal is down like this. So it's not a muscle that works very hard. That's why it's so tender. It has delicate flavor. And when you don't ever want to cook a, a, a loin in a braising or poaching method, because you'll actually make it tough. That's for use for when you have collagen or connective tissue in something and you want to break those tissues down. So in this case we're going to brown this up and cook this hot, fast and dry in the oven. So I have to say a shout out to Carol and Ron Leofau. This is some real meat that they can serve up to their boys and um, I just need a little Samoan music really. Sorry Ron. <laughs> some people are, it will, will make, will score the top of the roast like this and then come back the other way. This is very common in Denmark and you'll get this little crisscross and when it cooks up, this will crisp up. It'll look beautiful and they love to eat it. But we don't actually have that much fat on this piece of loin. Um, I am not going to do that because we're not going to present it as a whole roast. We're just going to slice it in the kitchen. So I'm not going to bother with that, but that is something you can do and you can see the little diamonds, it comes out real pretty in the end. All I'm going to do, and I've told you this before, turn on my heat just a little bit here. I have a pan heating. I always rub the meat with garlic and I, you know, whole cloves that are in the fridge already peeled or even in the oil is okay because this is going to be cooked. I like to use fresh garlic, especially when things are uncooked, like for a salad dressing. But it's, I just split them open. I rub this meat. I know that just looks too simple. That's all there is to it. I'm going to discard that garlic because I don't want to put an, un, an uncooked meat product on any other surface. And I'm going to bring this over here, salt and pepper, and we're going to put it right into the pan. And we're going to brown it off a little bit. It's not that big of an item, and I want to make sure I get a nice brown crust. So here with the salt and pepper, very liberally, I know that looks like a mound, I'm going to rub it all over. I want to start at the fat side down because that's the side I really want to be brown and pretty and the fat will melt in the pan and give me something for the, for the meat to cook in. I think you can probably hear that. You'll see some smoke, which is a good thing. Good cooking makes smoke. And we're just going to brown this off. This looks like a cake pan, but it's fine for roasting. You can have fancy pans, and you don't need fancy pans for this good cooking. I'm going to chop up a piece of carrot, some onion, and a piece of celery that I have left over, just like we did before when we were poaching. I'm just going to toss that in the bottom of the pan, and then we make the gravy. We'll have a, a really good foundation. So I'll be back in two seconds when this is browned, and I'll turn it over, and we'll pop it in the oven. Well, yeah, it's been about what, 90 seconds, two minutes, you think, Oliver? And I can see and smell and hear. Ooh, and I've got some pretty color. I don't want to overdo this. I just want to get the beginning of some color. Oops, I'm going to do this a little more because I don't want to burn it when it's roasting. I'm just getting the initial browning process started so that when my inside of my meat is done, I've got a nice brown, yummy what my friend calls greeblings in the bottom of the pan. <laughs> Hi to you, Bob. Uh, <laughs> um, and I told you before, if you have parsley stems, we always use those. And this is, a, you can see, dried up parsley that I'll use for something else. 
you have to throw anything away. But I'm just going to throw those in there. And I told you carrots. This is our mirepoix. Carrots, celery, and onions. I'm just going to throw those in there. This has all been washed, of course, so nothing's dirty. Whoops. Huh. Linging the food. And I'm not even going to worry about peeling this onion. I'll cut the core off. And some of the yucky parts just fall off, and that's fine. We're not going to actually eat this onion. We just want the flavor. So, there we go. And now, so that I don't have a difficult time laying this back down in the pan, I'm going to try to do this and lay it exactly like I lifted it up. There we go. We've got a nice beginning brown, a nice crust on the top. These vegetables will cook nicely bottom of the pan, they roast dry just fine. They don't need any water. I'm going to just take this over here. I've got this oven preheating to 400 so that it is nice and hot, and then I'll turn it back down. Actually, it's not reading right, but I'll turn it back down to 350 now that it's in. Bake. 350. And we'll come back when this is done. How do we know when it's done? In the cookbook, they'll tell you 170 to 180, I believe, for, for a pork loin. They don't want you to undercook your pork in this country because we have something called um, trichinosis. So they recommend you cook your, your pork to a certain temperature. But I can tell you in a restaurant, we don't operate that way. We have to hold our meat, so we actually undercook everything. So my, my training and my methodology is going to be that I'm going to slightly undercook this because I'm going to hold it for a while and the additional cooking time is going to bring it right to the perfect temperature and I don't want it to be dry. That's the problem with pork. There's not that much fat in the meat itself. So I'm going to do my best to show you just what I like my pork to look like when you cut it open and still have lots of juices left for the gravy. So we'll be back as soon as this pork breast is ready. Um, I, before, when we were poaching, I believe, I cut up a leek, which is a, a form of an onion. It's a long onion, very green on the end. Let me show you. It comes like this. Looks like that. Um, the reason it's white on one end is because it's covered up with dirt. The dirt is mounded, and they're very dirty. So when you cut into them, you have to take them under the sink, and especially right here, clean in between each and every layer. There are onions all over the world of various kinds. Scallions, garlic, shallots, just, there are just every kind of onion everywhere. And people incorporate the local onion into their cuisine. Leeks happen to be the national, uh, the national vegetable of Wales, if you can believe that. Um, so of course it grows in northern climates. And the white part, I'm going to just cut this up and saute this maybe add a touch of cream at the end. We're going to make them very, very soft, and that's going to be a version of creamed onions. I'm sure at holidays, many of you women out there are peeling small white onions to make a creamed onion dish for your family, and it's a lot of work. Leeks are really easy to work with. Um, my family loves them. They go great with turkey or any kind of poultry, but we're going to serve it with the pork roast today, which is my son Jeff's favorite. So let me just show you real quick how you do this. These have been cleaned and washed. I'm saving the green part for a stock because it doesn't get tender enough for this dish. And I'm just going to go down the middle of these. The bigger the leek that you can buy, the bigger the white part, the better off you are. You'll get more bang for your buck. But these were the biggest I could find. And I'm trying to make them all a uniform size so they'll cook evenly. And so now I'm going to take a handful, and this is just a little teeny French knife. The shape of it is made to the French knife. It fits my hand. It's quite sharp. And this is the one knife you really do need in the kitchen, ladies. And we're just going to slice through these. They are a little tough. They cook real tender. Take your time. 
when you get to the end, just reform the line there and just do your best to chop them up. As long as they're close to the same size, they'll be fine. See that? And I'm not going to force you to watch me cut up the rest. That'll take me another 60 seconds and then I'm going to put them into my hot pan. Be right back. My pan is hot. It's been heating. Remember I said when we saute, we would preheat the pan so it does the work. Because I'm going to add a little bit of cream at the end, which you don't have to do, but I'm going to for a holiday, I'm going to start with butter. You could use olive oil if you are on a, a special diet and you don't need to add cream at all to the end. Anyway, I got that in there. My pan's hot. I'm going to put in all my leeks. And this will cook down quite a bit, so don't be afraid that you've got so many you'll never eat them. They're the most perfect leftover for the morning after a holiday, because you put them on a toasted English muff muffin with a poached egg on top, and it's the best dessert ever, isn't it, Jeff? Absolutely. <laughs> he said absolutely. <laughs> so over to the heat. Now, I, this is a method called sweating. And when, when we, normally we saute, we leave it open and let the steam come off. In the initial process of this, we to cook onions translucent so that they look like they have scotch tape or they aren't opaque or not see-through. We want them to be kind of see-through. We're actually going to cover them and sort of braise them. We're not going to add any liquid, really, but the steam is going to get caught and they're going to cook at a lower temperature and not actually brown. We're going to avoid caramelization in this, not that it would hurt anything, but we're going to try to keep the color white. So I've got salt going in here. This is kosher salt, so it's got a bigger grain and thus I need to use more salt. So if it looks like I'm adding a lot, it's because the grain is quite large. Morton's has iodine added keep us from getting goiters. <laughs> anyway, I've got these in and I've got them all coated now with the oil. I'm going to cover them up, lower the heat to lowest, and let them just what we call sweat until they start to look really transparent and I'll taste one and see if it's tender enough because it needs to just melt in your mouth. That might take, I'm saying, 15 minutes, maybe more. But we'll cook this very gently. I'll be back when it's ready and show you what it looks like. We're back. I think it's only been 10 minutes. I wanted to show you, I don't know if you can see, it's all clear on the top because the moisture is hit, condensed, and dropped back down. See the steam coming off, so the moisture was captured. These are starting to look, you know, transparent, sort of. So let me see if I can hold one up there. It's still got a little white. But they're kind of you kind of see through, so I'm gonna taste one. Ooh, they're very close. Mmm, melty. They, I've already salted them. They could use a dash of pepper, but there's they they're really perfect to eat just like this. Um, so when you make this for your holiday dinner, this is made ahead of time. Just put it to the back of the heat and you're really ready. So whenever you, you know, it's time to plate, the very last minute you give it 60 seconds worth of heat and then you garnish you know, your meat with it. I'll show you how you do that when you plate. If you want to cream it at the very last minute, we'll put in just a dash of cream and stir it up and it's like buttering them. Of course, they've already been buttered because they were cooked in butter, but the cream gives it a little bit of a fresh taste. Um, that's all there is to it. I'll be back as soon as the pork roast looks ready. In fact, you know what? Let's give it a look. See, it's been 30 minutes. I can start to hear it, but it still looks kind of pink on the side. So it's just beginning to cook. It's probably going to take, I'm guessing, another 40 to 60 minutes. Um, it's a pretty big roast. We'll figure out when we're done how much time we did per pound to make it the proper temperature. Because it's hard for me to say exactly. It depends on how big your roll is, how hot your oven's cooking. Anytime you convect, you're bringing the temperature up 50 degrees. So if you've got a convection oven, you want to roast it at 350, you need to have your temperature actually at 300. Um, so there are those variations. So we'll come back and we'll check out the time and then we'll tell you how much we actually cooked per minute. Be back.
We've been in an hour and 10 minutes. This is a 4.8 pound roast. And I'm gonna do something terrible. You should really never do this. You should use a thermometer, but <laughs> I forgot my thermometer, it's at home. So we're gonna go right in and we're gonna see the juices. And if they come out clear, Virginia Weirs, you taught me this when we were kids. You were the greatest cook I ever knew. And see these juices? They're running out clear. There's not, they're not bloody. So I know that my roast is cooked almost, really, it's looking good. And it's firm. You see how I'm pushing hard. I know this is hard to do when the, when the roast is hot, but I'm pushing and it's not getting very much. You can see the veg, the juice, the vegetables have a little color. Um, it's really nice and firm. I'm taking it out. And of course, I'm going to let this rest because we've gone over this. Meat has to rest. And the bigger the piece of meat, the longer it has to rest. So now I have time to like make mashed potatoes, cook up my vegetables, mix the salad, whatever it is I'm going to do to complete this holiday dinner while this meat rests. And then I'll be back and I'll be taking it out, collecting the juices, and making the gravy right here in the pan. Be right back. Okay, this probably looks clumsy to you all, but I just keep it simple. I'm just taking this out of the pan. I'm, this plate isn't quite big enough, but almost. And I'm going to let it rest here, and then I'll be able to catch the juices as they come off. And here, I'm going to actually just cook this right in this pan. You could, if you wanted to, put this into a small saucepan if it makes it easier for you to stir. And I actually want to get all these yummy things off the bottom of this pan. The greeblings, as Joe calls it, or Bob, I'm not sure. Joe, are you Bob or not? So, <laughs> see all that brown stuff right there? That's what makes the pork gravy taste like pork. So we're going to catch all that. And if you have more brown, that's fine. That just means you'll have a richer gravy. We're going to smash all these vegetables up. I know this looks kind of ghastly, but it's going to be incredible. Once again, beef consomme, Campbell's product. I, it's my favorite. It's demi-gloss. Beef stock, veal stock, chicken stock, those are the things we use in a professional kitchen. But this has the gelatin added, which is like a real stock, the gelatin coming out of the bones. And as it reduces, it thickens into this velvety texture, and that's what I want. It's going to be just enough brown gravy flavor that it's going to enhance the pork flavor, but not overpower it. Um, if it were too strong of a, of a stock, I wouldn't be able to use it. So, you like to put the little, hell, whoops, I can't get it, but you want to put a hole on the other side so that you don't have a vacuum and then it comes pouring out. This way, if you get the hole on the other side, you can pour gently. And this is a big roast, so I want enough, I'm just going to add a whole can. I want enough to go with the mashed potatoes as well as the meat. Now what we do, we're going to make something called a whitewash. This can be made with flour. I've had seen people do that out in the country where I'm from. But it's really better to do with this with a cornstarch. Um, that's the flour that comes from corn, the starch. And cornstarch has twice the thickening power of flour. So a, tea, a tablespoon of flour will thicken a cup of gravy. And I think that might be enough. I can always add more. This thickens a gravy in 60 seconds when it's boiling, so if it's not thick enough, I'll know right away. So I'm going to stir cold water into this. This is kind of a trick. You can make silly putty with cornstarch if you, if, you, if you do it just right. I'll show you that one day. But in the meantime, we're just going to add a little at a time. See how I'm stirring out the lumps? I get it all smooth. Add a little more water so that it's nice and liquidy. Now the cornstarch is suspended. If we leave it sit for a little while, it'll, it'll separate and you'll need to stir it up again. This is also called a slurry. They use this in oriental cooking a great deal. My stock is cooking, boiling is what I want to say. And my vegetables, they're getting, see when you put the cold water liquid in, 
It cooks the brown right off and into the into the gravy. So we're going to have lots of good flavor from these vegetables. And I'm just going to add this a little at a time. It will take 60 seconds to thicken. And you can see it's, it starts out looking milky and as it gets clear that means the starch is cooked out. You don't want to leave the starch uncooked because it won't taste good. This is the fastest way to make gravy that I can think of. I don't know if you can see that's a little silkier. I need a little more. Let it come back to a boil. You, gravy is something where you need to be a little bit patient. <coughs> it's not hurting your meat to sit. Your leeks are ready. Your mashed potatoes are whipping over there. And I'm going to give a little taste. It doesn't need salt because the, the roast was already salted. It might need a little pepper. It has a beautiful natural flavor. This is very American. No wine involved, just vegetables. And now, of course, I would let this roast rest approximately five more minutes. But you can see all the juices that come out of it. That's a great pork flavor. And I'm going to add all of that back to the gravy. I'm going to let it cook 60 more seconds and I'm going to turn the heat off because then I'm going to have the texture that I like. This again is called reducing. It just fortifies the flavor. I'll be back with the plates. We're going to cut the pork and plate. <laughs> French cooks are known for putting cream in everything. I do not believe in over creaming because as my auntie would say, anybody can cook with cream and that's true. But you have to understand cream is 30% butter fat. It's not all butter fat. So you're getting part of your milk proteins, you're getting some good milk product in here with the, some of the butter fat in it and it has such great fresh flavor. It's better, I think, than actually just buttering something. So I, I control how much cream I put in things. I don't just put in a cup of cream. I'm not trying to kill everybody. So I am just going to, see, I just glazed this. I'm ready to serve. I'm going to cut the meat and I'm just bringing this back to a boil. Let me turn the heat up just a little bit. Simmer, I should say, which will happen faster anytime that you have a lid on. And as soon as it does come to a, to a simmer, I'll take the, heat, the lid off and let it reduce until it's nice and thick. Okay, here we are. Our gravy is done. Um, you know, you, if you're going to strain this into a gravy bowl for everyone to serve themselves, you take your strainer and you strain it into the gravy bowl. But I'm going to slice this and plate this, so I'm going to just keep it in this pan and preserve that one step of getting a gravy bowl dirty. And I'm going to pull out my slicer, and I'm going to take this fork, and let's just go right down the middle and see what we've got, see how well we did. That's perfect. I don't know if you can, it's, it's, it's not gray, but it's not pink. It still has lots of moisture, a touch of give, but so that it's not overcooked, but it's not fresh out of the oven so that it's so tight and that it's not tender. So, and I don't know if you can see that, but it's still steamy. That's how hot it is. It's still cooking. It's very hot to touch. And I don't like too thick a slices, but I don't want to be chintzy. So that's not the sharpest knife, but I'm just going to slice this up. And can you see the juices there, Ollie? See how juicy that pork is? I can't stand dry pork. That's just the natural coloring. That's not raw. That's a brown. That's not pink. And here I'm going to lay this down here. And of course, we have our mashed potatoes at the side and maybe some a side dish. And I'm going to go get the leeks with my fingers. Here we go. Let's see how they're doing. Oh, look at that. They're perfect. That 60 seconds was really all we needed. I know they need a touch of pepper because I tasted them earlier. Again, I don't really like white pepper, so unless we're doing a really French dish, I'm going to put black pepper in. That's because I'm from the Midwest. 
And these will sit warm in a dish at the table for a long, long time. And it's really just an accompaniment. It's not exactly a vegetable. I'm going to put it right here. And at a holiday dinner, I might serve that with the cranberry chutney, with the, with the fresh cranberries from Massachusetts, which I promised to make for you when I do a turkey for Thanksgiving. I'll show you the cranberry chutney recipe. Meanwhile, I'm going to be quite lazy. And, well, I guess I'll take a spoon because I'm not that lazy. And I'm going to strain some of this gravy right over this, pea, this pork. Of course, if you had your mashed potatoes there, but maybe you're on a starch-free diet. <laughs> and it is the sauce that will make this, make any dish, really, wonderful. That's why the French are famous for their sauces. And I'm going to let you watch my son eat this and see if I think he's enjoying it. Jeff, when you serve the plate, I know this sounds silly, but, and maybe this is almost even backwards, but you put the meat in the front. The, the vegetables or the potatoes are at, at like 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock and 10 o'clock, whatever the rules are. But you want to put the meat in front of the person so that they can pick up their knife and fork and dive right in. So meat is always at the front of the person. <laughs> Let's see what he says. Mm. How's the pork cook? Just right? Perfect. It doesn't get any better. Oh, good luck. I hope this recipe works for you. Goodbye, Carol. Goodbye, Ron. Goodbye. <laughs>